of introduction. Well, I wish to thank Mark Tarrant for these uh, kind words of introduction. With former students, you never quite know what will be said. This has been enormously kind, I would say, uh, even generous, and uh, I thank you for introducing me. I'm conscious of uh, the honor that it represents to be asked to give these lectures in such a distinguished series as this. Um, as uh, the principal has told you, I am by birth one of those awful upper Canadians that caused so much trouble for the rest of Canada. But I, I, I did the right thing. In fact, the only sensible thing, and uh, married uh, a, a woman from this, from this province, from the Maritimes at least. And uh, in fact, her roots are very deeply uh, involved with the Annapolis Valley. And we're returning to this part of the world on a, an auspicious occasion in our, in our lives, which I won't tell you about because you'll be embarrassed by that. But it's very nice to be here and uh, to, be, to have this kind of part in, an, in a university that I've respected for a long time, have looked at from the outside because we've been very often in Wolfville, and uh, now I can be a little bit part of this place, and I thank you very much for the invitation. I have provided you with uh, an outline of what I want to say in these four lectures, uh, the title of which really uh, tells the story the end of Christendom and the future of Christianity. The title of these four lectures <coughs> is intended to suggest the overall hypothesis that I wish to develop in the lectures. To state that thesis in the briefest possible way, it's my belief that the Christian movement can have a very significant future, a responsible future that will be both faithful to the original, to the original vision of this movement and of immense significance to our beleaguered world. But I think that to have that future, we Christians are going to have to stop trying to have the kind of future that nearly 16 centuries of official Christianity in the Western world have conditioned us to want, have conditioned us to covet. That uh, coveted future is what I intend when I use the term Christendom, which means literally the dominion or sovereignty of the Christian religion. Today, I believe, Christendom, so understood, is in its death throes. And the question we all have to ask ourselves is whether we can get over regarding this as a catastrophe and begin to experience it as a doorway, albeit a narrow doorway, into a future that is more in keeping with what our Lord first had in mind when he called disciples to accompany him on his mission to redeem the world through love and not through power. I'm going to develop the, this thesis <clears throat> over the course of the four lectures, and the stages of my argument are, I think, fairly clearly designated by the titles of these four lectures. So let me proceed at once to the first <coughs> plank, as it were, in my argument, the decline and fall of Christendom. To say that Christianity in the world at large is undergoing a major transition is to indulge in an understatement. What's happening is nothing less than the winding down of a process that was inaugurated in the fourth century of the Common Era. To that great shift 
that began to occur in the character of the Christian movement under the Roman emperors Constantine and Theodosius I, there now corresponds a shift of reverse proportion. What was born in that distant century, that is to say the imperial church, now comes to an end. That beginning and this ending are the two great social transitions in the course of Christianity in this world. All the alterations and turnings in between these two, and of course history is change, but all the, in, all the alternations and turnings between these two great transitions are minor ones by comparison. And I would include in, include in that statement the Reformation of the 16th century. To confess faith in Jesus as the Christ at this point in time is therefore to do so within the context of a religion whose historical destiny is undergoing a metamorphosis, literally a change of form, of shape, of morphe. This religion has been a great power in the world and it can still be regarded here and there as though its imperial status were yet intact. But it is nevertheless in process of being reduced. While some semblance of Christendom may find a new home in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, I think that its period of Western dominance is over. The decline and humiliation of Christendom in the West is, of course, a process. It's not a, matter of, it's not a matter of sudden death. Indeed, in those places where Christianity has seemed to be extinguished suddenly, there's often been an interesting kind of resuscitation. The experience of the churches behind the so-called Iron Curtain of the immediate past is the prime example of this. Christianity in the Marxist-Leninist lands did not so much die as it found itself being put to death. There could be no place for this opiate in the new society. But precisely the abruptness of that alteration in status combined with the fact that it was imposed by a hostile and mostly unpopular ideology, caused many who, like their counterparts in the West, would certainly have been ready to wend their way into the religionless world, to pause. To pause. The suppression of the faith in the Marxist-Leninist land was in many ways the reason for its resurgence as a lively and critical posture. It's going to be very interesting now to observe the fate of Christianity in those same lands now that the official threat to the church's existence has been removed. The normal process of Christendom's decline is by contrast with that Eastern European experience very gradual. In some places, including much of our own continent, it can even appear that Christendom is alive and well unless one looks beneath the surface. In fact, the farther south you go on this continent, the more it can seem to be alive and well. In such contexts, Christian congregations and even whole denominations are able to carry on as usual, as if nothing were happening. But this response is often visibly contrived, and it is viable only as long as the economic conditions of churches are relatively sound. With each new decade, more and more Christians are driven to realize the watershed through which Christendom is now passing. All the same, the transition to the post-Constantinian or post-Christendom situation 
is hardly a new phenomenon. Though unnoticed by many, the dissolution of Christendom has already been in process for a century or two. It would be impossible to read the philosophic and literary works of the Western world from the 18th century onwards without realizing that new attitudes were in the making which, if they did not topple the Christian establishment immediately and dramatically, as was attempted in revolutionary France, would certainly do so eventually. While 18th century rationalism was ameliorated by evangelical pietism, and while 19th century pagan romanticism was ameliorated by the Christian romanticism of Schleiermacher, the Oxford movement, and other groups, the process of secularization was well underway, and uh, despite religious revivals of various types, it has continued to be so. If one reflects on the other end of the Christendom, Christendom phenomenon, namely its beginning, one is not surprised that it should be slow in ending. The inauguration of Christendom occurred, as you know, in the fourth century of the Common Era. This is simply a fact of history. But even dictatorial governments like those of uh, Theodosius and, and his uh, other cohorts, even dictatorial governments do not inaugurate such complex phenomena as religion. Rome could no more initiate Christianity than Moscow could dissolve it. After the codes of Theodosius and Justinian, paganism still flourished in many places, especially in the countrysides. In fact, the term pagan, as many of you will know, derives from the Latin paganus, meaning villager or rustic, roughly equivalent to the American word yoko, uh, the country folk, in other words, were not quick to change their obligations from the old gods of Rome to the new religion introduced from the imperial city. Besides, the tribes uh, of the north, some of which dealt Rome its final blow, were not fully Christianized for centuries. Moreover, even at its height and despite its often violent efforts, Christianity never managed to rid Europe of alternative faiths, notably Judaism and Islam, but also, as we noted under the time of Adolf Hitler, the old pagan religions were still there under the surface, ready to be revived in many different ways. So we should not suppose that the terminus ad quem, the other end of this same religious process, would be anything but gradual. People don't alter their systems of belief quickly. The vestiges of Christendom are still very much present, even in the most secularized populations of the formerly Christian West, and they will undoubtedly never wholly vanish. But this does not mean that the points of tra transition at both ends of this phenomenon are so gradual and, in and inconspicuous as to be less than great transitions. Clearly, something happened to the Christian movement when it was adopted by the Roman Imperium in the fourth century to be the official religion, and something is now happening to the Christian religion as it gives way to new cultural and religious realities, including widespread secularism and religious pluralism. The ending of Christendom is not as obvious to us as was its beginning, but that's partly because we are directly involved in it. But that it is occurring <coughs> can only be doubted, I think, by those who do so on the basis of ignorance, disinterest, or because of vested interest in the preservation of the imperial model of the church. 
Understandably enough, <coughs> there are such vested interests in the retention of Christianity, and they are very potent ones. After all, a phenomenon existing for 15 or 16 centuries is very well established indeed. Its establishment, as we'll observe more, more fully presently, is by no means only a legal affair, uh, though even in situations like our own where the church was never established in the de jure or formal sense, there are legal dimensions that do resist change, such as in North America, the limiting of taxation upon church property. More entrenched are the cultural uh, dimensions of Christian establishment. But when I speak of vested interests in sustaining the imperial model of the church, I have especially in mind ties of a more internal and institutional character. Though the Christian faith entered the world as a movement containing provocative anti-institutional elements, it eventually expressed itself in well-defined institutional forms. Such forms, as we know from history, regularly outlast the visions and objectives that gave rise to them. We have witnessed enough in our own lifetime to understand that the structures of Christian denominations, like the bureaucracies of governments and corporations, will defend their existence just as long as possible. I believe that commitment to the established institutional models of Christianity, to Christendom in its various institutional forms, I believe that this kind of commitment is the single most important cause of inertia and retardation of intentional and creative response to the great historical transition through which we are passing. And yet even those of us who find the entrenchment of Constantinianism an impediment and who are often literally sickened by the, result, the resulting falseness and inertness of the churches and of ourselves, many of us are ourselves in one degree or another still dependent upon the continuation of the Christian institutions. Even if our livelihood does not depend upon the maintenance of these old ecclesiastical forms, few of us are either spiritually or materially equipped for the kind of non-established situation that pertained in the early church or for the disestablished situation that has been the fate of significant numbers of serious Christians throughout the history of Christendom and is found in many contexts still today. The vested interests that keep Christendom from disappearing, even when it is clearly a drawback to the emergence of a livelier form of the church, these vested interests do not, in other words, all of them belong to popes and ecclesiastical bureaucrats and other powerful segments in the contemporary churches. They are to be found in almost all of us in one way or another. One suspects that much of our ecclesiology and church polity is informed by a process of, of corporate rationalization aimed at justifying the status quo. The effective end of Christendom is after all a traumatic historical experience. It is a future shock, far greater in fact, than the demise of classes, nations, or empires. For not only had Christendom, has Christendom outlived, uh, outlived the Roman, the Holy Roman, the British, the Russian, and other empires that espoused Christianity, not only has it survived the many systems with which it has been identified, the imperial, the feudal, the early mercantile, and so forth. Not only has 
has Christendom lasted well beyond the dysfunctioning of monarchies, aristocracies, and other seemingly permanent uh, institutions of the West, but the trauma produced by Christendom's demise is qualitatively different from any of these other endings. It has to do with the type of expectancy surrounding Christendom, and it is therefore rightly named Christian Future Shock. That expectancy was of another order. While it had very definite mundane dimensions and consequences, it was at base supra-mundane in character. The church, it, it was felt, would be the doorway, indeed the only doorway, to eternity. Thus it would not only endure, had not the Lord himself assured his disciples that the gates of hell should not prevail against it, it would not only endure, but it would prosper. Other institutions, kingdoms, political systems, governments, other institutions might come and go. Even divinely ordained offices and structures could pass away, their usefulness ended. But as the portal of God's own kingdom, the church could only expect a glorious future. The shock created by the prospect of Christendom's ending is engendered in particular by this kind of high expectation. The future that must now be contemplated seems altogether to contradict the future that centuries of official Christianity taught us Christians to anticipate. Christian mission under the conditions of imperial Christianity in the West has been confused since Gregory the Great at least with Christian expansionism. We tend to equate the great ages of missionary activity with those moments in history, particularly in the 19th century, in which the Christian religion gained more quantitative power in the world and more territory than ever before. Such an equation of uh, mission with expansion ought certainly to be questioned by anyone who takes the New Testament as one's guide, but that confusion of Christian mission with Christendom's victories was a natural confusion given the whole mythology of historical growth that has seemed uh, to almost every Christian to be built into the faith itself. In order better to appreciate the incongruity between Christendom's conventional expectations and the reduced destiny that now seems to open out to us, we shall consider two expressions of typical Christendom scenarios which come to us from sources close enough to our, to our own period to remind us how very recently Christians entertained a conception of the Christian future markedly different from the evidence that now invades our consciousness. In 1934, <coughs> a collection of essays was published under the title, The Christian Message for Today. The subtitle of this work describes the book as, and I quote, a joint statement of the worldwide mission of the Christian Church. And its authors were some of the great American Protestants of the period, many of them whose names you would immediately recognize. The object of these authors, as the title and subtitle suggest, is to offer an inspiring call to Christian mission today. But celebration of the Christian present and future requires a foundational history that can also be celebrated. And this is what, just what we are given in this book. I quote, from its inception, write the authors, Christianity has been expanding geographically, beginning as an inconspicuous Jewish sect 
one of the least of the many cults seeking to make a place for themselves in the Greek or Roman world, it early outgrew its Jewish swaddling clothes, became cosmopolitan in membership, and within less than four centuries was the dominant faith of the Roman Empire. End of the quote. Now already in this little summary of Christian beginnings, we note two interesting and well-rehearsed themes that frequently appear in this type of literature. First, the humble origins of the faith in a Jewish context that was obviously too narrow for it, a theme with only slightly cloaked Marcionitic and possibly anti-Jewish overtones. And secondly, the assumption that Christianity's adoption by Rome was a fortuitous, indeed perhaps a divinely ordained eventuality. Yet, as the historical outline continues in this book, we learn that the Christian religion was also too expansive even for imperial Rome, which could only serve as a kind of temporary vehicle for its promotion. Again, I quote, when the Roman Empire collapsed, Christianity, although by that time closely associated with it, not only survived, but won to its fall the barbarians, the barbarians who were the immediate cause of the overthrow, spread into regions in northern and western Europe which had not known it before, and became the chief vehicle for the transfer of culture of the ancient world to Europe, to the Europe of medieval and modern times. End of the quote. Here's another familiar theme of the story that Christians learn to tell about themselves. Namely, Christianity is the bearer of the highest culture, preserving what is true, good, and beautiful from the past, and yet transcending the political forms that manifested these values and these virtues. This same theme persists then in the next statement of the thumbnail sketch of the Christian past and its progress. I quote again, in the Middle Ages, Christianity was an integral part of the intellectual, social, economic, and political patterns of the day. Its theology was formulated in terms of the prevailing scholasticism, and it was apparently a bulwark of the existing feudal society. Yet, when the medieval world disappeared, Christianity persisted. Not only so, but when in the 15th and 16th centuries, European peoples spread into the Americas and won footholds in Asia, Christianity went with them, became the faith of the peoples whom the Europeans conquered, and ameliorated the cruelties of the conquest. Now, to be sure, that's the end of the quote, to be sure this is a nuanced statement, Christianity as such is not identified completely with the conquerors, and it is rightly claimed that the faith ameliorated very often the cruelties of the conquest. But if this episode in Christian history were summarized in two paragraphs today, their content would have to be very different. From the perspective of present assumptions at work in liberal and moderate churches, it would be hard to avoid the hint of both racism and imperialism, even in this rather careful summation of the book that came out in the 1930s. Now the statement moves toward articulation of the underlying historical hypothesis informing it. The continuous ascendancy of Christianity, setbacks notwithstanding. I quote again, occasionally Christianity has suffered major territorial reverses. In the seventh and eighth centuries, <coughs> Islam won from it vast areas and numerous peoples. In the 14th and 15th centuries, the wide-flung posts of Nestorian Christianity in Asia 
were almost wiped out by Tamerlane and his cohorts. In the present century, the church in Russia has been dealt staggering blows. Yet in spite of the fact that Christianity has never fully regained the ground from which it was driven in these defeats, usually it has more than made good in other regions the area lost. Never has Christianity been so widespread as today. End of the quote. <clears throat> now, what surely strikes the contemporary reader of this paragraph most forcibly is the almost innocent manner in which both Christian failure and Christian successes are interpreted in straightforwardly territorial terms. Not only is it assumed that, as we put it earlier, mission means expansion, but the, expression, the expansion in question means the acquisition of more territory. When I employ the, the term imperial church to the model dating from Constantine onwards, it's this conception of the church that I have in mind. Generously, one may say that Christian imperialism is gentler, usually, than that of worldly empires. The Christians uh, conquer for Christ, at least in intention. But what the Christian uh, church so motivated seemed to want for Christ seemed in the end not essentially different from what the worldly empires wanted, more territory. That is why it's not quite sufficient to think of the Constantinian church only in numerical terms of numbers of people the church as majority, as I sometimes phrase it. This mentality also usually extends to the control of space, as well as what the space contains by way of population and culture. The author of this 1936 volume now presses home to his conclusion, the point to which his whole historical summary has been moving all along, and I quote, in the history of mankind, no other religion has been professed over so large a portion of the globe or by so many people as has Christianity. From the outset, Christianity has claimed for its message universality. It has maintained that it has a gospel for all men. More nearly than any other faith, it has progressed towards the attainment of that goal. While of the other two great surviving missionary religions, one, Buddhism, has long been practically stationary, and the other, Islam, has made few, if any, major gains in the past hundred years, Christianity, in spite of the many obstacles which beset its path, is still spreading. In no similar length of time, have its boundaries expanded so rapidly and so widely as in the past century and a half. End of the quote. I'm going to refrain from commenting on the obviously anachronistic assumptions about the other two great surviving missionary religions and even more anachronistic conclusions concerning the magnificent expansion of the Christian religion. What should capture our attention here, beyond what has been said already, is the way in which this kind of analysis, and this is only one instance of an entire genre, automatically leads to the assumption, not only that Christian is going to in, Christianity is going to enjoy a still greater future, but that it and it alone deserves a destiny of that nature because it is superior to all others. Its qualitative superiority is demonstrated by its quantitative successes. And its quantitative successes are due to its qualitative superiority. The second document that I want to share with you a little 
uh, applies the same thinking to the Christian future. In the final pages of a work published in 1926, bearing the currently intriguing title, The Dominion of Man, E. Griffith Jones asks about the place, and I quote, the place and function of the church in the regenerated social order, unquote. Not surprisingly, Griffith Jones' answer begins with an allusion to the Great Commission of Jesus. I quote, The first mandate the church received from its risen master was to go forth into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This mandate is still in force, for the work has not yet been accomplished. After 2,000 years, there are uncounted millions of the human race who have never heard the Christian message. We are, however, in this work, envisaging a time when this will have been effectively done, and when the whole race has long been under the sway of the gospel. End of the quote. Now, contemporary readers of this statement may well, may well be astonished at it, but we are reminded that a journal still flourishes, which bears the name that it does, because prominent elements in all of the major denominations of this continent fervently believed not long ago that the 20th century would be the Christian century. Griffith Jones having endorsed that same credo, proceeds to outline the church's role in the fully Christianized society of the near future, as he believes it to be. I quote again, The church then, once uh, everything has been Christianized, will be able to give herself to a still higher task. It will be hers to evangelize each fresh generation before the forces of evil have had their chance of poisoning the virgin soil of the new humanity, of training it in the knowledge and nurture of the Lord from the beginning, and of developing its spiritual nature into fullness and power. It will once more join its forces with science and with literature and with art and be their inspiration in every effort to enlighten and enrich and beautify life. It will hallow the relation of man to nature and sanctify all the uses to which his ever-enlarging control of her energies, of nature's energies, will be put. It, the Church, will safeguard social privileges from abuse and political power from tyranny, It will spiritualize commerce and trade and industry and humanize the relations of those who cooperate in the production of wealth or take part in its distribution in the exchanges and markets of the world. The distinction between the secular and the sacred will disappear from human life, for all that is secular will be sanctified When this ideal state will be be realized, the world will once more be God's world and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here the author pauses. Is this a fanciful picture, he asks, perhaps in the meantime having looked up from his desk into the street below? On the contrary, he says, It is but a faint sketch of the world which has been in the making since the light first broke over the primeval chaos and the earth was prepared for man's coming that he might take his place as God's vicegerent and fellow in bringing such a world into being. This is the final end of the providential order, the last for which the first was made all that remains to be done in order that it may be realized is that man should at last rise to the fulfillment of his providential function 
and join his energies with the mighty power and wisdom of God in loving obedience and joyful service. On the sunlit hills of time, the city of God, the commonwealth of the redeemed. End of the quotation. Now this liberal version of the Christian future, and this is a sterling example of it, seems in some ways even more triumphalistic than orthodox Christian futurology because the otherworldliness of the orthodox futurology is now translated by the liberals into this worldly forms of realization, thereby rendering them visibly utopian. And we are speaking now about the year 1926, 1926, when this book was written. Only eight years earlier, Europe had witnessed the problematic and tragically inconclusive end of the bloodiest war in human history. Within three years, the stock markets of the world would crash, and already millions of poor people were living seismographs of the coming Great Depression. Moreover, in 1926, it was possible for Christians to interpret both the world and their own Christian place in it very differently from the way in which Griffith Jones interpreted it. Karl Barth in Germany and Reinhold Niebuhr in Henry Ford's Detroit were commenting upon the works of God and upon Western humanity as well as the empirical church in terms that are really 180 degrees removed from Griffith Jones' happy liberal outlook. While Griffith Jones paints his picture of the Christian future in liberal terms, it is nevertheless a version of a very old conception of the character and the prospects of Christendom. Different ages of Christian history have assigned this conception of the church differing details, but the broad themes persist. They include such ideas as that it is the Christian mandate to turn the whole of world, the world, if possible, into church, that this mandate comes from Jesus himself, that other religious faiths are not to be honored seriously but seen at best as preliminary stages on the way to truth, that humanity is separate from the rest of nature and intended by God to dominate the natural order and enabled by Christ to do so, and so on and so on. And I say just this scenario is what can no longer be sustained. Today, informed and reflective Christian thinkers would have to describe the emergent future of the Christian faith, of the Christian movement, in ways that diverge markedly from those assumed in both of these relatively recent studies from, from which I've quoted. It is a very different scenario of the Christian future that is gleaned from Langdon Gilkey's Through the Tempest or Hans Kuhn's Theology for a Third Millennium, the Third Millennium, or David Tracy's Plurality and Ambiguity. Both the Oxford Illustrated History of Christianity and uh, Christianity as Social and Cultural History, two of the most ambitious recent surveys of Christianity, tell the Christian story, past, present, and future, in a manner that would have seemed utterly foreign to Griffith Jones and to the authors of the 1936 book, The Christian Message for Today. Many influences have brought about this historiographic change. The decline of Christianity in the West, the decline of the West itself, the failure of the modern vision, the new consciousness of their own worth on the parts of non-European peoples, a critical perception of the technological society, 
on the part of many who have experienced its most advanced forms, the impact of religious and cultural pluralism, especially perhaps in North America, and not least of all, the self-criticism of serious Christianity, its recognition of its own questionable triumphalism of patriarchalism of the equation of the Christian mission with Euro-American imperialism and so forth. To a great extent, wrote the Dutch theologian Hendrikus Berkhoff, expressing a new realism about Christian history that is shared by many reflective Christians in our time, to a great extent, official church history is the story of the defeats of the Holy Spirit. Dakar. With that quite radical summation by a theologian who is far from radical, I will bring this first lecture to a close. I've argued that Christendom and the kind of future that Christendom conditioned us all to expect that Christendom has been called decisively into question. And the next stage in my argument will be to ask, what are the typical responses of Christians today, especially in North America, to this altered status of Christianity in our fast-changing planet? Thank you very much.